Welcome back. Now we're going to see a bunch of examples of the use of arrays in Java, including some multidimensional arrays, and then at the end we're going to see the enhanced for loop, which I think I advertised when you met the three-part for loop the other day. Now, the first thing we're going to do is to have you fill in the blanks for an algorithm to calculate the dot product of two vectors a and b. We already mentioned this as a thing you can do. So this is just a warm-up of a thing you've seen before. So have a think about how you would do that. In a real lecture, I would pause and ask you to write it on paper or something. You could pause and you could even write it in an editor or something. And here's the answer. You saw this before. We're just going to add to the accumulator variable sum the product of the ith element of A with the ith element of B. And we're going to do that in a loop that goes over all the elements of both arrays. Notice the i less than b dot length in the middle there. That's really important because if we had i less than or equal to b dot length, then we would fall off the end of the arrays. Make sure you understand why that is. Next one. We're going to fill in the blanks here for an algorithm to calculate the average value of an array of doubles. Here's the template. I don't think there's anything to say about this. It's completely routine. Pause the video now and have a go at writing it. And here's the answer. Very short, this one. The two steps we have to go through besides initialising the sum are to add up the values and then we have to divide the sum by the length of the data. And notice we're going to get an answer of the right type because sum is declared to be a double. Remember this thing about how division works depending on whether the arguments are integers or doubles. Now a slightly more complicated example. We are now going to demonstrate um, various other aspects. It says setting array values at runtime. I forget exactly how that's going to work out. But anyway, so we've got two different arrays of strings here, one for the available ranks of a standard set of cards and one for the suits of an available set of cards. We are again going to use the math.random function in order this time to identify a random card. So i is going to give us a random rank and j is going to give us a random suit represented as integers in the appropriate range. What else is there to say about this? Um, you remember the casting of a double to an integer? That's the int in brackets at the front of each of those lines defining i and j. Uh, and then we are going to index into the arrays of strings using our randomly generated integers in order to produce the appropriate strings describing first the rank and then the suit. And so you get output a bit like that. Ah yes, and now here we go, setting array values at runtime. Because what's going on here? We're going to start ourselves off by defining an array of strings deck, which is this time going to be an array of 52 strings. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fill in the elements of that deck of cards, of that array called deck, by using the previously defined arrays rank and suit. And so we're going to have nested for loops this time. So we're going to iterate over both the ranks and the suits. And we're going to calculate the appropriate index into deck from the indices we have into rank and suit. So you see we've got 4 times i plus j. Remember we have bod mass. Um, multiplication takes precedence over addition, as per usual. So what's going to happen is, for example, if we happen to have i equals 1 and j equals 2, then this line is going to set which element of the array deck? It's going to set the 4 times 1 plus 2, which is 4 plus 2, which is 6. It's going to set the index 6 of deck to be the appropriate string that's constructed from those 
specifications of the rank and suit. Here's a quick understanding question for you. Here's two possible orders in which we could have ended up putting the cards into the array deck and hence printing them out in the for loop at the bottom there. Which of those two is correct? I think I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to say have a think about it and if you're not sure build the program and try it because that will be educational. Here's the thing to notice. We used two suits, two arrays, sorry, suit and rank, um, which are fixed. Um, our intention is that they ought to stay fixed throughout the program because um, the, the available ranks and suits are not going to change. Um, and the magic number 52 is supposed to be the product of the lengths of those two arrays. Um, but those facts are not yet enforced in our program. So sometimes you might want to enforce it by using local constant values instead. So what's happened here is we've added the special keyword final in front of our definitions. And what that does is it tells the compiler that there should only be a single initialization of that variable. After suit has been changed, it should, uh, after suit has been initialized, it should never be changed again in the program. And the compiler should, chain, should complain if there is any attempt to change the values of suit, rank, and cards in future. By convention, when we have variables with the final modifier, um, we write them in all caps like that, just so that when people see them later in the program, they realize that these are final variables. Um, and this can be quite handy to avoid um, unfortunate errors in later edits of the programs where somebody who doesn't understand that they shouldn't edit these things accidentally does so. Can be a useful way to um, improve readability by getting rid of, of magic numbers. So now instead of the number 52 we've got the final int cards which is calculated to be the length of the array suit multiplied by the length of the array rank. Um, and arguably this gives the reader of the program um, a better idea about the role of that number 52. Um, certainly if that number 52 is used multiple times in the program and it later needed to be changed for some reason then there would only be one place in which it needed to be changed and that would be a good thing. However, that argument loses force here precisely because we've argued that that number never should be changed in the lifetime of the program. So there you go. Um, some people will say you should always replace magic numbers, as they're called, so literal numbers that play a role in your program by a named constant like this. I think that's going too far. I think it's a judgment issue and you should do whatever you think actually makes your code most readable. So there are other ways to deal with this kind of situation, and you'll see more of them as you learn more about Java. But I don't think you should blindly replace every magic number by a named constant. Um, just for a reductio ad absurdum example of a case where that would be silly, um, don't go replacing zero every where it occurs in your program by the named constant zero zero. That would be silly. You should always think about what you're trying to achieve. There are two things you're trying to achieve, and they're strongly related. One is that you should make the program easy to comprehend, which implies, for example, that it will be easy to debug when it turns out that it doesn't do quite what you want. Um, and the other related thing is that you should make it as easy as possible to make foreseeable changes. That is, you should en enable your maintainers to change your program as easily as possible in the future. That's the property of maintainability. Now, I've said foreseeable changes because you will find, as you get more program design experience, that it often happens that a change you make to the way your program is designed that makes one kind of change easier simultaneously makes a different kind of change harder. Sometimes you really get there, isn't, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Um, and for that reason, thinking about which aspects of your program's behaviour might need to change in future is important, even if you have to admit that you cannot perfectly foresee which changes are likely to actually happen. This is part of the judgment 
that forms part of being an expert programmer and it's part of what makes it fun. We're really getting off into software engineering beyond just programming at this stage. Now let's think about shuffling a little bit. There are various different algorithms for shuffling cards and actually you might like to read up on it. Um, it doesn't particularly form the focus of this lecture how we're going to do it. But how we are going to do it in this program is we're going to say given uh, an array deck of our 52 or whatever cards, uh, our cards number of cards, um, we're going to try to put, put them in a more random order by this process. We're going to say in iteration i we're going to pick a random card from the subset of the deck which is the collection of cards from the, the index ith element of the array deck through to the end, through to the index cards minus one element of the array. Um, and this is going to be uh, uh, uniformly at random. We're going to e each picking, each card is going to be equally likely. Having identified that random card, we're going to exchange it with the ith element of the deck. So you can see that, that in iteration zero, uh, we are picking any card from the deck and we are exchanging it with the ith element of the array and then as we go through each iteration has fewer and fewer cards to choose from. Okay, so here's the code that does that. What is there that I want to say about this? Not a lot actually, I think you should be able to understand that from what, what we've done so far pause the video and have a look at it if you need to. Now here's a longer piece of code, probably the longest we've seen so far, that puts everything we've done here together. We are going to set up our arrays to start with and fill in our array deck with all the cards that are possible given the ranks and suits we have. And then we are going to shuffle the deck as described above and having shuffled them we're going to print out the shuffled result and again if there's anything there that you're not sure of just pause the video and satisfy yourself that you understand it you might find it useful to actually program it and play around with it a bit here are some of the possible outputs So far our arrays have only had one dimension. We've only had one index to say which, ele which array element we're interested in. But quite often we have arrays with more than one dimension, for example two-dimensional arrays. So here are a few examples. Um, you might have a collection of experiments um, and some outcomes from running each experiment a number of times. And So you might want to talk about the result of experiment 3 on the sixth time you did it. We might have a table of grades for each student in each assignment, or you might have something which is more literally two-dimensional. We might have a table of grayscale values for each pixel in a, two, in a 2D image. Mathematically speaking, the abstraction you use for that is a matrix, and the Java abstraction is that we have a two-dimensional array. So let's see how we do that. So here's how we do two-dimensional arrays in Java. Now, pay careful attention, both here and when you're programming with them, because although the basic ideas are very straightforward, it is quite easy to get yourself confused over the syntax, and in particular, to my mind, it is possible to get yourself into a state where you expect the dimensions in the line where you define a two-dimensional array to be given in the opposite order to the way they actually are given. So have a look and make sure you understand how it works in Java. We use this notation with the double square brackets um, to access the elements of a two-dimensional array and the argument that the index that comes first, the i, gives you the row number and the element that comes second gives you the column number. Now that is not going to be too surprising. You have to remember of course that everything starts at zero as per usual. So 
the code on the left is showing us how to initialize a 10 by 3 array of doubles. That is, we've got 10 rows um, and each row has three elements in it, so we've got three columns. In passing, of course, it's actually unnecessary to initialize this array of doubles because it automatically gets initialized to the zero du double element, namely 0, 0.0 in every place, just as with any other kind of array. But I think it's here because it's the simplest possible code you can show for doing something with a two-dimensional array. So in the diagram on the right, you see how this works. So every element of the two-dimensional array is identified by its two coordinates, one giving the row and one giving the column. And you can think of the element A5 as being itself an array, which is an array of three elements. So that's what the arrow indicates there. So just ha give yourself a moment to make sure that you understand how to access each element and how that corresponds to how we put them in in the code. Here's another example. Um, as with one-dimensional arrays, we have a way of initializing the arrays by listing their values. And this will end up looking very much like a kind of matrix that you might have seen in maths. And it's very much to your advantage to lay them out clearly in your code, as is done on this slide. Let's make sure that we understand how to access the elements. We've got our, our two-dimensional array P here and each element of it is itself an array of type double and you can see that in the notation for initializing it quite clearly. We're initializing it here with a collection of arrays in turn. Now suppose we're looking for the element P13 of this two-dimensional ar array. Which one is going to be element P13? Well how we think about it is we look at the first index first. That's the thing that might be slightly counterintuitive. Row 1, that is P1, is itself an array of doubles. Then we're looking for column 3, and so that's what we find there. P13 is the intersection of row 1 with column 3. Once you can talk about matrices, you can do all kinds of useful things with them. For example, you can add up matrices if they have the same dimensions in the way you've almost certainly seen in maths. Uh, so here's a piece of code that says, suppose we have two n by n matrices A and B. Let's define C to be the n by n matrix whose elements are simply the sums of the corresponding elements. And we can do that using two nested for loops, exactly as shown in that piece of code. Only slightly more complicated is to do matrix multiplication. And this draws on the dot product idea that we had earlier on. And there's the code for it. Very similar again. And you can see that the index k occurs closest to the product sign inside there. That's characteristic of matrix multiplication. If you're unsure about this, just pause the video and absorb it. There's not really anything else to say about it, theoretically speaking. Now, I think arguably this really ought to have been with the for loops, and it was probably to do with the lengths of in-person lectures that means that it wasn't in the first place. You've seen many examples now of three-part for loops, such as the one labelled ordinary for loop in the middle. There's often a better way to express this kind of thing in Java, and that's to use the enhanced for loop. So if you look at the example at the bottom, it does exactly the same thing as the ordinary for loop just above it. Let's study the difference. What we're doing here is we don't have any explicit iteration variable. So i has completely disappeared. And that is because it is so common that what we want to do is to iterate over a collection in order, starting at the beginning, going on to the end, and then stopping. And here is how we do it when the kind of collection concerned is an array. 
So this just says, because that's so common, Java provides special syntax for doing it, um, but it's going to do exactly the same thing. It's going to iterate over the collection numbers, which in this case is an integer array, and apply the body of the for loop, in this case just system out print them, to each of the elements of that array. We've completely elided the indexing in to the, to the array just because that is simply going to be done in order. And that's often a handy thing to do if you don't need direct access to the index, then why have it? So this is also called a for each loop, um, and the colon that we saw there between the variable declaration and the thing we're iterating over can be pronounced in, so like for each integer i in the array. Um, and so it goes how you'd expect, really. On each iteration, an element of the iterable gets assigned to the loop variable, and the loop is executed once for each element in the iterable. Um, it's easier to write, it's less um, syntax, and there are fewer things to get wrong. Um, in particular, you can't um, make a mistake with the um, less than or less than or equal to for the end for the um, ending condition of your for loop, which I warned you against making before, because that's being automatically done for you. Um, it's less flexible in the sense that you don't have access to the loop counter. So if you ever catch yourself wanting to keep track in your for each loop of how many times you've gone through the loop, um, that's probably a sign that you should actually be using a three-part for loop in this particular case. Um, but you should use for each loops whenever you don't need access to the loop counter, just because they're easier to get right and easier to write in the first place. Uh, so that's the general form of it there. Um, we'll see later on that you can use for each loops on all kinds of Java collections, not just arrays. Um, the variable must, of course, have the same type as the elements in the thing you're iterating over, otherwise it would just make no sense. Here's an example of that. The example at the top is correct. We can say if we have a, a string array words for string w in words, so for each string w in the array words, print out w. It would be wrong, of course, to put an int w in there um, because this string words doesn't contain ints, so there's no way you can assign w to an int each element of, of words. I think people sometimes are tempted to do that just because they have absorbed the special role of int that int often plays in the three-part for loop, but provided you understand how this actually works, I don't think that's a problem you're going to fall into at all. So that's worth knowing about. So in summary of this lecture, we've been talking about um, structured data storage, basically. We've been talking about arrays as methods of storing large amounts of data and how you use them and the syntax that Java provides for them, and how to access elements given their indexes. By the way, I've probably been saying indexes and indices alternately through this lecture. You can really say it either. Uh, we briefly talked on the way about using local constants, using the final keyword um, in an attempt to improve maintainability and readability. And finally, we talked about the enhanced for loop, which is a great alternative to the ordinary for loop, where you just want to iterate over a collection and you don't care about the indexes themselves. That's the reading for this week. <laughs>